I'm living a good life. Living a good life. I'm living a good life. Living a good life. Welcome back to the Agostino Zinga Show, episode number one, two, six, uno, dos, siete. Hola, todos. It's me, Agostino. Welcome back to the Agostino Zinga Show with moi, your host, Agostino. Let's say that one more time, just in case you forgot. Welcome back to the Agostino Zinga Show with your host, Agostino Zinga. What's up? What's going on? What's really good? How you saying? Hope you're doing well right now. Hope you're good. Hope you're well rested, well hydrated, well lubricated, um, limber. You, you know, all your all the bones and aches in the morning that you get up with have kind of like you know they've kind of wrinkled themselves out a little bit, and you're feeling you're feeling good. You're feeling whole because I'm feeling special, very very special. Okay, today's Thursday. I love a Thursday. I don't know why. Thursdays for me work really well, but you know Thursdays are a good day para me and for everyone else that's involved with my family. But yeah, here we go, locked into the show, one, two, six, oh my god, time is going so fast! Man, it is cold as a mother foo out there right now. London is freezing, London is freezing. As I'm sure most people that live in um, places that aren't in South America, in Southeast Asia, in parts of Africa, in wherever else where it's fucking hot, you would know that winter it's finally upon us you know we had a good summer we had a good run everyone was looking good um we felt like we were gonna have a summer the whole year round especially london wise because you know if you're familiar with the uk you'd know that our weather is extremely temperamental if not quite predictable in the way that it always 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 rains it always rains it always rains you know that saying goes it's when it goes um it rains in spain well it rains in london doesn't rhyme but it's true it fucking rains so it rains a lot it's very dark it's very gloomy and this um winter has been no different i kind of woke up this morning a bit early to go to the gym and I left my house, I wouldn't say that early, 7 o'clock is not as early as I usually get to the gym most times, I'll have you know. But 7 a.m. in the morning was pitch black out there. Like, might as well been, it, it, might, it might as well been 4 a.m., right? It might as well been me coming back from the fucking Club of Nights, you know, at 4 a.m. stumbling back home trying to get the last beer in order to carry on a party. I do that quite often, you know. I try and get a last beer before I'm coming back home, right? One last tinny. And then inevitably what happens, I wake up in the morning, I uh, fell asleep on the living room, uh, on the sofa because I don't want to disturb the brunette, right? And then I look to my right and there's a fucking quarter, f- there's a, I've drank like two thirds of the beer. It's still full, but obviously open. So it's, it fucking tastes like, you know, flat lemonade. So it's not really the vibe. And I'm thinking, why did I do that? Why do I always try and extend the party and the party never gets extended? You can't extend the party on your own with a beer in your living room in the middle of Stratford. It's not the most sexiest thing in the world. But I do it all the fucking time. Trying to extend the party. It never fucking works. Need you just relax and say, you know what? No more extender or partying. I will stop and I will go just go home and sleep. But, you know, you get confident. You feel like you, you can rule the world. You know, you got a bit of alcohol in you. You got a bit of your spirits high. Someone gave you a compliment. Says, like, you said that they liked your outfit. Thought you were funny. And you came around bouncing. Like, yeah, man. Top of the world. Top of the world. Top, top, top of the world. Top of the world. Top, top, top of the world. Top of the world. Top, top. You go to the shop. You buy a beer. You're like, top of the world. Top of the world. Top, top, top of the world. Top of the world. Top, top. You walk home. You're up the stairs. Top of the world. Top of the world. Top, top, top of the world. Top of the world. Top, top. Open the door. You head to your making sofa to have a seat because just your legs are a bit tired you're not actually gonna sleep though you're just tired top of the world top of the world top top you lay down your head on the pillow because you're not obviously you're not sleepy you're just a little bit tired you rest your head top of the world top of the world top top and then boom you're out <laughs> you're out like a light like a light you're out you're completely out you wake up in the morning at 8 a.m and you've got a, a beer right next to you on a, like on the table next to you you gotta be careful when you wake up you don't roll over and spill all over the carpet because that would be an absolute nightmare you're just thinking, why did I do that? Why did I try to extend the party? It never fucking works, man. And, I, and I'd assume, again, because I don't get invited to the after parties. But I'd, I'd assume after parties, after, after the after party um, scene is probably the same. I'd, I'd assume there's a there's an actual science and an art to it too. You have to come into it not as 
inebriated as I am when I go out on a normal night. I think you can't do that. You have to kind of, if you're the after party person, you have to kind of start drinking quite late or just not drink at all, especially during the night out and just kind of wait to get your drink on in the after party, which is kind of weird because it fucks up with your body clock, right? Because when you go to an after party, it's usually sometime after 2 a.m. And you're usually going to stay out maybe until about 10, maybe the latest, maybe 11, right? So you have to kind of tell your body like, okay, peak hours are going to be between like, I don't know, um, 7 to 10 or 8 to 9 or 8 to 10, right? You're going to have to kind of convince your body. But the only way to do it is to kind of, to, the only way to stay awake is maybe to have some drugs or to have an, some alcohol. But the only way maybe to to do it, maybe to sleep earlier in the, in the evening, I guess, and wake up later, like I did when I went to fold that time. I slept. Um, I think when I went to fold for the opening party, I must have slept like a normal evening time. So sometime before 11 o'clock and then woke up at like four or five. So like I was going to the gym, but it was a lot harder to do that time because I didn't have that. You know, when you have that conviction to go and work out, even though you're tired <coughs> and you're a little bit over it, you still find a way to kind of, you know, get yourself through it and kind of soldier through and get on outside and, you know, the first mile is always a bit difficult, but after that, you start to level out a little bit. But when you're clubbing, it's not the same thing because you know, you know, essentially you're going to go to a dark nightclub where they're going to be playing really loud songs really quickly. Um, maybe not the most conducive place that someone just woke up, but yeah. I'd assume the after party scene is probably similar. You have to, it's a real science. You have to really go into it with a plan. You can't just roll out from a Weatherspoons or from a bar and just decide you want to go to an after party because you'll be an absolute mess. You embarrass yourself, your friends, and your family. So it probably is for the better, best that I try and extend the party when I get back home. But hey, ho, say la bo. It's been a pretty um, uneventful, or not uneventful, I'll say a pretty mellow weekend, I guess, for the most part. DJ on a Friday, went out for a bit on a Saturday, Sunday stayed in. Um, pretty cool. I've been doing loads of running as per usual, getting back on that boat. I'm kind of ha I kind of have a long term plan in head in my head. I kind of want to get ready um, for the Hackney Half Marathon because I missed it last. I missed it this year. I did it the year before that it was good, but it wasn't my best performance. And the year before that it was good, but not best performance. It's probably the one race that fucking kicks my ass, man. I've done some difficult races in my time. You know, the Chippenham um, Half Marathon in Bristol is pretty difficult. Um, the Half Marathon in Barcelona is pretty difficult. The Half Marathon in Berlin is pretty difficult, but the half marathon here in Hackney, this one is just it's a real, 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 real punisher. Um, it's a fairly hilly. I say it's fairly hilly for the most part, especially that first mile and a half or first two miles as you come out of um, Wansted Park and you head up, uh, you head right up towards Homerton. So that's one continual kind of up, uphill battle you're struggling towards until you get to maybe Homerton Hospital where it kind of levels out a little bit. But then you've got lots of windy roads. And then once you hit um, the kind of new, the kind of uh, Stratford Village, Wick, Hackney Wiki area, there's not a lot of skyscrapers. Sorry, there, there's not a lot of tall buildings. So when it's really hot, especially during the summer, the sun's beating down on you. You've got absolutely no shade. Most of those roads have been newly tarmac. So they have that new kind of black tarmac. They just kind of... You know, it absorbs heat like a fucking motherfucker. So it's like a, you look like you're running on a frying pan. Um, so it's extremely hard. It saps your energy. It's very hilly. Um, those are twisty bends um, here and there where they're not actually needed. The the home stretch on the way back is annoying because you you're I don't know what the what the road is called, but it's near Homerton, near where the Astro where the cages. There's loads of speed humps, like on that kind of, there's a one road before you get to like the last mile, let's say, where it's just loads of speed humps, like road humps on the street. So you have it to kind of run over those as you're, as you're running back to, uh, to complete the last mile. The only way to kind of like not do that is to run on the pavement, but then everyone's walking, watching on the pavement. So that's annoying. So uh, I really want to have a good time. A good time for me would be somewhere between the 135, 140 mark. I've never actually hit that. My fastest I've run ever was 146, I think, for a half marathon. But I'd love to do a 130-something marathon. That would be so sick. 130 half marathon would be amazing. Just fucking jogging, blitzing it all the way through. And it's achievable, you know? It is achievable. But i just got to put in loads of mileage and just get my run, get back on my running tip as I was pre as I was doing it like a few years ago when I was back at um, Dr. Martin's. But it's been pretty good this time around. I've been running quite a lot this week. I did my long run on Tuesday, right? Because I went to the gym this morning. Yeah, Tuesday after work, I went, I ran back from work. So my work is based kind of 
around the Farringdon Station area. So I ran back from, from there all the way to Stratford, which is about six miles. I kind of ran, I think, about five miles, 90-something. So just under six, which is pretty cool. Um, at the moment, I'm kind of coming in at about 50 minutes. I've done that previously before when I was at my peak, about 46. So, you know, I'm a bit off my personal best. But this is just a kind of, I wouldn't say it's a race. It's more like a training kind of run. Plus, running back after work. You can't really race anyway because that work when that work that coming back from home that that commute home that window from like five to seven is just insane on the streets like there's just so many people coming trying to get, you know get back home at a reasonable hour that it's not even impossible to race i'll be able to race home and kind of do a fast time if i ran at like 8 p.m but that would require me staying you know three hours later at work and then encounter for another hour coming back it just doesn't it's not worth my time but I've been able to run back home pretty quickly, which is good. The fucking gnarly thing about running home, though, the funny thing, right, is that the last, the first, the first, the last couple of days, I've been run, I've been taking a bus home, mostly to save money. One to save money, but secondly, mostly uh, because I want to read my books. Right, I'm trying to finish a lot of the books I hadn't read this year, and just trying to you know finish them off before the end of the year or so before I do my end of year wrap up, which you should look out for. That I'm going to do a review of all the books I kind of read um, in the year and pick out some of my favorites. Um, but what I realize with the running back sometimes or oh, the bus back the bus is amazing because i get to read and it's nice to kind of be outside i know some of you are aware that you know if you live in a metropolitan city and you're always in the subway always underground it just can get a little bit nauseating you know to kind of always be underground to always kind of be in that kind of you know morning rush to always be in that commuter rush always be standing next to somebody sweating our pits people fighting for chairs like just crazy in it right Every day, there's always some some fucking lullied trying to fight for a chair on the central line. Every single day, and it's like the central line is one of the most heavily congested trains there is on in the fucking London Underground, right? Everyone uses that central line because it goes to most parts of London, if not all, especially if, if you want to connect somewhere. <coughs> and these people want to fight for a chair or fight for a seat. It's not worth it. It's not worth your time. Maybe coming back home, you have the advantage because some people go to... Usually, everyone goes to work at the same sort of time, but no one usually leaves the same sort of time, right? Some people leave at lunch because they've got meetings. Some people leave a bit early. Some people leave at four because they've arranged it with their boss and stuff. But you can, you're can you more likely to find a, a, a seat on the way home than you are on the way back to on where you are to work, in my opinion, personally. I just think it's just too nuts, uh, especially the central line. I don't, I don't know for any other line out there, but personally for me, for central line, it's a bit too crazy. So what I do, like a grown-up, right, is I go on the train, I just resign myself to I'm not going to get a seat. And also, I tell myself that I work in a fucking office on a laptop, sitting in a chair for seven to eight hours a day, right? The last thing I need is to be sitting down again. Like, I can just, you know, I can do without the sitting down. I, I, could, I might need the exercise, right? It might be good for my, um, not exercise, let's, let's take that back. It's not, standing up is not exercise, right? It's like people that drink excessive amounts of water at work. You know that person at work that's got the fucking water thing and they're filling up every five, ten minutes, like chugging the water, like they're drinking some, like, get, get fit quick shake or some shit. It's so annoying, no? Is it only me? I hate, I hate excessive drink, water drinkers. They always have people that drink so much water and then you go on their desk and they've got fucking bag after bag of M&Ms and Maltesers and shit. Like, something doesn't add up here, mate. Maybe the water helps with the digesting of the chocolates, right? Because I remember when I used to be a fatty, I used to love drinking water sometimes too because it was a good way to kind of like continue dr uh, eating chocolates, right? Because the, the, the logic goes that fat people like to drink fizzy drinks, but not really sometimes because you get bloated. So what you do when you're fat and you want to eat sweets and chocolates all the time, you drink water or you drink some juice. So which is not going to give you any gas so that I can, you can continue um, scoffing down on those sugary confectionaries, huh? those chocolates, right? You can just keep throwing them into your mouth. But that's I, I hate excessive water drinks at work, honestly. It's just one of the things that annoys me. A second thing that annoys me, which I just thought about comes to my head, is the person that stands up all the time. I've got a couple people at my workplace who are just always standing. Maybe because I got my back to them, so it makes me feel uncomfortable, right? Someone's always peering over my shoulder, look at what I'm doing. But there's always somebody standing, there's always a couple of people standing around, just walking around, standing, walking up, go doing this, walking. I know for the most part, it's that kind of tactic people do at work, where if they're doing something they don't really enjoy, or something that doesn't require, you know some, you know some jobs that we have don't necessarily require eight hours of the day, right? Some jobs we could probably do in five or four. We don't need eight, it's ridiculous. Like they just they, You don't need eight hours to do the job some people are doing, right? So... But, you know, we've all collectively accepted that, you know, for eight hours is the thing and 
you have to give your time in order to get money back and blah 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 right we've we'll accepted this kind of weird agreement that eight hours is the kind of rule that we kind of work around it's you know when it doesn't necessarily apply to people that work in the office if you're working in a building site maybe you might need that eight hours right you might need that shift in order to kind of get the work done you might need even more sometimes in order to kind of uh, meet a deadline but office work you don't need eight hours i guarantee you especially when people are trying to get you into meetings or trying to ask you to chip in on or ask you to take part in a brainstorming session at 5 30 p.m like go and jump off a building like really jump off a building you see that building over there climb up the side of it or if you can't do that jump in the elevator press the top floor walk out to the roof peer over the ledge and just lean over just lean don't walk don't run and jump just lean and then let gravity take you where it needs to be some people are just bizarre isn't it absolutely bizarre absolutely bizarre people well yeah um so yeah excessive water drinkers piss me off a lot at work really pissed off and people that stand around a lot like just standing like walking around standing 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 like sit the fuck down man like oh anyway whatever i don't I, I even know what i was talking about i went into a rant about people drinking water but yeah imagine hating someone that drinks water but yeah anyway oh about trains so yeah so sit so usually i resign myself to not taking a start having a seat which is fine because you know you need the you need the bodily endurance. Because you know? sometimes I see people that are like overly... I look at people with a weirdly that... You know people that kind of have those um, at-home coffee mugs? Right? They have those things that you kind of fill up your own coffee at home and you take it to Starbucks and for 50p like a fucking pauper. Can you fill up my coffee, please? Like, and you give them 50 pence and shit. And you feel like you're saving the world, right? Like, fuck off, right? Not not, not around me, right? You're a grown-up. Buy a coffee like a fucking grown up, right? I say, Pret, do fill a coffee for a quid. Most coffee is not going to cost you more than five pounds. If you can't afford a coffee um, on your way to work, maybe drink it at home before you go to work, right? Or and most workplaces have coffee machines at, there. I don't think I've seen a, a, a workplace, regardless of where you work, doesn't have a quite a decent coffee machine. You might find some places that have those kind of powdery coffee places, but um, powdery coffee stations, right? Like hospital coffee. But for the most part, we all have good coffee in our workplaces. So I kind of look at people that carry around uh, that excessive walking water, water or sorry that that are like super desperate to sit down on the central line or, or trains in general. Like, oh, thank God, I've got a seat. Like, if you if you're not a mum, if you're not if you're not a mum to be, if you don't have kids around you, if you're not like over a certain age, um, or if you don't look like you have some sort of physical ailment or shortcoming that doesn't allow you to stand up for too long. Number one, why are you walking around in the underground? Ah, uh, figure that one out. But if you've got all those things, fair enough. But if you're just like a regular person, you just need to sit down. Like you need to take a long, hard look at yourself in the mirror. It's all like people that carry those kind of, you know, those portable coffee cup things. Like, really? Do you really need that? Like, do you, as a grown adult, do you really need to be shaking? Like, because you, know, you really succeed in people in a, in a, in a way in a more. That's why sometimes I think some people have like a weird like some people don't look at things the same like you know people have that kind of you know people give people that are begging for money sometimes on the street that weird looks oh my god man that's horrible i could never do that or when it's an alcoholic like clearly an alcoholic in the morning like necking several tins of you know some nondescript beer you're like oh mate like his life is a horror show right but then here you are in the morning right you have, probably haven't got your makeup on because you you can't wake up early enough in the morning to do your makeup at home so you have to kind of fucking get your whole fucking sephora makeup kit out on the train and start painting your face right and we all as communities have to pretend that we don't notice what you're doing it's like people snogging or fingering each other on a train you have to pretend like it's not happening when it is right in front of you it's inappropriate right yes i'm comparing putting your makeup on uh, on the train as you finger banging some random on the pl on a train to in, you know on a way to work at 9 a.m one of those things doesn't happen and one of those things does happen but whatever you decide right sometimes as, as an adult you just wake up early enough in the morning to fucking do your makeup and to have a, have a cup of tea i don't think that's that weird of a of a take like honestly like some people just like they just want to wake up just in with just enough time to have a shower and get dressed and walk out which is nuts because imagine the kind of energy that you're bringing into your workplace imagine the kind of uh uh go get it attitude you're bringing to that workplace it's not gonna be that good man if you that's how you're rolling out of bed you're rolling out of bed just to have enough time to get up just enough time to get dressed just enough time to have a shower like you're not gonna be the best colleague that day i don't think so personally wake up in the morning wake up a bit early have a coffee at home with your socks on walking around your house chilling you know what i mean looking at your phone Put on your makeup in your comfort of your own bathroom. 
I'm sure many girls must have tested this. Like, there's nothing that nothing that compares to your own bathroom, right? It was a girl because you you're used to lighting, you know where things are. Do you know what I mean like you're comfortable in the space? Maybe because sometimes you know um sometimes it's hard because when you're when you're having a shower and you have those kind of bathrooms that don't have good enough ventilation, they can kind of fog up quite quickly. Or something if you're a girl and you do makeup in there, it might not be a good idea to do your makeup in a bathroom that's uh, full of condensation. But, you know, maybe open the door after you finish showering and let it cool down for a bit and then do your makeup after. Like, I don't know. Isn't it that more comfortable than doing it on the train? Especially when you're rushing to it. So imagine, because I, th- I think my nightmare scenario is this, right? If I'm a girl, if I'm a person that likes those coffee things. I get on a train one day and it's like, you know, those days of the strikes. So everything's out and everyone's trying to get on one particular line. You get on this train and it's fucking packed to the rafters. Like, so packed that you can't even move. Like, shoulder to shoulder to shoulder. You can't drink your coffee. You can't even read a book because it's so packed, right? You can't drink coffee that you've made so it goes cold. And you can't do your makeup because there's not enough room. Then what do you do? Do you have to go to work and then use up work's time in order to do your makeup in a toilet really quickly? In a stinky toilet in your workplace that 700 people use? It doesn't make any sense. I don't get people, man. Like, people are honestly the weirdest. And then the, those same people go to work pissed off, annoyed. Then they get pissed off, annoyed at the most mundane thing that happens at work. Because, you know, when you're at work, sometimes people over people over-exaggerate um, their grievances at work by the Mac, by, you know, by a factor of 10. It's just, it's insane. Um, then you don't take enough holiday because you forget or because, you know, you're afraid the manager might say something. And then you wonder why you're not happy. You wonder why you haven't got good job satisfaction. Take a break from ho- take a break from work. Put some time off for a vacation. Do your makeup and have a coffee or a breakfast at home. Don't be a fucking psycho and start buying your coffee every single day on the way to work. Like, that is a lot of money. It doesn't make any sense. I don't care what you're earning. Save that money for if you're spending money when you're going on holiday. Save it for spending money to buy yourself some new clothes. Save for spending money to take a friend out. I don't know. Save that fucking money. That's five quid a week. What's that? 40 quid a month um, if you're only counting four weeks. That's a lot of fucking pee, man. 40 quid a month. You could t- you could take out one of your friends every month for th- every month of the year and and have the first couple of drinks be on you just from just not taking a coffee at work. Or on a buying a coffee on the way to work. That's it, simple. No, let alone what you could do for your parents, let alone what you could do for your spouse, let alone what you buy for yourself, or let alone what you could put into your savings for a future project. Like it's just insane. It's insane. It's insane. Absolutely insane. There's been times I've been to those coffee shops and bought a coffee just because I want to read and s- I want to sit there and read and I feel guilty. Right? It doesn't matter because it's a fucking chain. They don't. It's not like I'm going to an independent coffee shop and I'm just taking up their space. But it's not like I feel guilty. I just buy coffee for the sake of it, or like a it's a pack of peanuts or a banana or like a, what do you call it? What do they got in prep? They got that chocolate brownie thing that I love, but Jesus Christ, man. Like, yeah, the working, the work, working life is just so weird. Just so weird. Just so weird. I can't, I can't wait to get out of it though. Um, Overall, I think the whole time sap thing is just a lot. Giving your time in order to kind of get money back is just not worth it Um, in the long run. So need to champion on forward and kind of get out of the Maya, but it's just an amazing place to really observe humanity. Um, it's just an amazing place to see like what adults are like, you know. Because I always see workplaces as a lot as an ex- as like you know what and as an extension of school, or maybe not even as an extension of secondary school for the most part. Where you kind of figuring yourself out, you're awkward and clumsy and shit. But I see adults that way too, especially in office, especially when you're working like in a co-working space. Adults are so strange, so weird, man. The, the little peculiarities, you know, what they eat for lunch, uh, how they talk to each other. What they say, how they walk, how they carry themselves. Like, it's just funny. I just love it. I love all of that stuff. But the actual going to work and attending the work, count me the fuck out. But w- watching the peoples and stuff, it's amazing. I'm surprised no one's done. Again, like, I, I think I mentioned it a few times to some people, but I, I know, like, um, there's always really interesting stories where, um, regarding people that work in department stores like um selfridges and stuff right there's always really interesting characters there some career retailers um or sales assistants who are you know really fucking good at their job um who've kind of got that whole client um relationship uh patois down to an absolute t and i think that would make for an absolutely incredible incredible documentary like you know it'll be so cool i'm oh, reality tv show sorry for life of me i can't remember why i forgot that word um maybe because i don't watch those shows because i'm a man huh? men don't watch those shows but i think um no i think honestly selfishness would be an amazing reality tv show um idea especially if the, uh, if the premise was maybe you could just follow a group of people 
Each of which is right. You could take, you could take one person from each tier um, uh, of employment at, at Selfridges and kind of follow them around and stuff. Or it could be like a challenge thing where you're kind of trying to be a, a floor manager or what's that thing called a brand lead, a brand expert, I think of what it's called or something like that, right? That'd be my, my good good job or like a uh, race to be a supervisor or some shit. Um, that would be so cool. I would watch the fuck out of that. I know they did like a, a Selfridges movie before starring Jeremy Piven before all the kind of controversies about him came out. I think it was called Mr. Selfridges or something like that. But that was based on the original founder of Selfridges. Like, so back in the days, I'm assuming like, I don't know, 18 something, 1800s or some shit like that, right? Selfridges has been around for a while. I know they did that, but I think that would be cool. Maybe not, maybe not a place like Harvey Nichols or whatever else because they're a little bit stuffy and boring. But Selfridges has got enough characters, especially to just the just makeup floor alone. Like, imagine it's a reality TV show based on just the girls and boys that work on the makeup department. Like that would be insanely fun, insanely fun. Especially if they a, if they could somehow incorporate their outside life into it, right? Where they followed somebody. Like imagine if the makeup um, floor, they found out some of the girls had a YouTube channel, or some of them were into drag, or some of them um, were DJs, or some of them I don't know were pursuing a career in presenting. I don't know wherever it may be. That would be cool to kind of follow that journey all the way through the ups and downs of drama. That would be fucking awesome. So anyone out there. As a TV producer who's looking for an idea and you want it for free, ah, you're welcome, right? Reality TV show, um, send it around, serve with your staff, take that, develop it, give me 10% on the back end and I'll be happy! And some roll and some credits too. That'll be sick, innit? You know, they have credits on the, on the end, like executive produced by Agassina Zinger. Yee! Um, and I don't watch it. Imagine, that will be cool, innit? Imagine being an executive producer of a reality TV show you don't even watch. Ballin'! But anyway... Enough about my rambling of the week and shit. Hop onto some topics. Topics. The the topics. 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 The the topics. Number one. Hate to talk about football, but fuck it for a little bit. United are through to the knockout phases of the Champions League uh, via our less than inspiring victory against young boys the other day um and yeah man the less said about that the better really i think isn't it what 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 can be said that hasn't been said already um regarding this win puts my microphone down here before i start eating my face and shit um what a strange strange time to be a united fan eh like it's a fucking bizarre bizarre world to be a united fan right now let me see if i can get this out of the way boom 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 Move this, move that. Why isn't it just load normally? Come on. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, what a weird time to be a United fan. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what else to say, man. Um, what we got here? Mourinho is an embarrassment. Yeah, he is an embarrassment. I say for the most part. I think he's a very aware of it, though. So I don't think we're saying anything about him that he's not going to be aware of. I think. It's just his natural reaction. He just needs to defend himself, he feels like, justifiably because of, you know, of all the stuff that's been, all the mud's been thrown at his name. And I think he's got some reasons, some valid reasons behind um, his kind of outrage with the media and how he's so snipey and he's always kind of got a chip on his shoulder. I think he's got legitimate reasons to be annoyed because, you know, he's, he looks around the managerial landscape at the moment, right, with the top managers, most of whom are quite are newly appointed managers. Some of them are quite young in some respects, right? Um, and he doesn't see many people who have kind of won as many honours as he has, right? And he comes from an era where many managers were judged upon trophies they won, right? You look at someone like a... Uh, who's a good example? You look at someone like a... Carlo Ancelotti, for instance, right? He gets hired for jobs mainly because of the titles he's won in different countries. Luis van Gaal, for, a moment, for another for another example too was another one who kind of got hired because he won trophies in various different countries there was an era when that was very much the reason why managers were hired because of the you know of the trophies that they were able to amass in there in the trophy cabinet of said club but nowadays football's kind of progressed for the most part maybe it's because of social media because you have to kind of like you know 
uh, clips are made and shared across Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and stuff. So you can't necessarily show clips of like parking a bus football, right? It doesn't really work that well there. You kind of have to show like quick counter-attacking football, one touch, uh, sweeping moves, um, very clever formation play. Like you have to show that kind of stuff in order to make it entertaining. So maybe some of the big wigs of these clubs, football directors are looking at it and thinking, you know what? I'd much rather hire a sexy manager like a... Uh, Bielsa at Leeds, right, who plays really weird attacking football where you're, you know, you're, you're effectively playing only two defenders at the back, right, and everyone else is playing up front, right? Um, fast flowing attacking football, one touch. Um, you'd much rather see that and not have any trophies in your cabinet and get all the eyes on you, get sponsors to kind of line up and kind of want to sponsor you. And, you know, and the the leagues, especially in the England, the leagues probably pay as much, if not more, than what um, these uh, trophies pay. Trophies kind of add, you know, a lot of allure. They can be a good legacy. Um, it's good for the club overall. You might tie in with sponsorship. But, you know, these clubs sometimes parachute payments and money bonuses to stay in the Premier League is quite often very, very high, very, very steep. A lot more, it's probably a lot more worth your hassle than trying to win the FA Cup. So they hire sexy managers and then Mourinho's probably looking at it thinking, you know what, I'm out of... He's probably not in vogue at the moment, but he feels like his trophies um, should allow him a kind of a grace that he's not being granted with the English media. But I just think in general, you know, the English media have had it with him. They've just, you know, he's not their darling anymore. Um, in, in in the same way that, you know, remember when pundits used to make excuse after excuse for Arsenal and Arsenal Wenger. There's just some people in the media who they just have their favourites. And, you know, Man United have never been a, a, a critic favourite anyway, even when Flag Ferguson was at a club. Man United will always hate it. So it's funny to see how these pundits are kind of lauding and, you know, waxing lyrical about the old Sir Alex Ferguson days, like as if they all liked him. They hated him because he used to ban them from their from these press conferences. But for the most part, people hate Man United anyway. Plus, Mourinho is not necessarily playing brand of football people like. That's exciting. And he calls people out on, on their shit, which which journalists hate anyway. They hate being questioned, right? They just they think they're the fucking authority when it comes to all things football and they just know just as but just when they just, when they know just as much, just as much as we do as fans. So, yeah, he's an embarrassment, but you know, so are the press and the journalists that kind of cover him and blow up minute things into big things and stuff or twist these words in order to kind of get him in a gotcha moment. So they're playing a weird game for the most, most of them for the most part. Uh, um we we share playing football. Yeah, we're shit at playing football. We're not very good. Um, I think that's very evident to say. Whether or not it's a recruitment thing, whether or not it's a player thing, personnel thing, whether it's a coaching thing, I don't know. But there's no hiding behind it. We're not good at playing football. We don't look good at playing football. I don't think anyone... You know, you know, it's a good example, a good kind of barometer to see how shit we are at football. When I went to watch Man United play the other week at a pub, sometimes they'll have like, you know, a running order of games. People left when the Man United game came on. They just left and went home. Like generally left like I was like oh, okay and that was different before you'd see of course people would leave if it wasn't a West Ham or Arsenal or Chelsea game right because most of it's in London but for the most part people hang around for the United game but everyone just left <laughs> I was like wow that's how far we've fallen where randoms in a pub are like you know what I'd rather I'd, rather, I'd much rather go home and you know and chill with my wife and family even though I'm in half drunk than fucking watch May United play which you know I can't blame them towards that um, we have separate teams playing. Yep, I'd agree with that too. Um, that um, there's definitely separate teams. You, you see that a lot with them, um, young, especially when we're at home because the pitch is so wide. But especially against young boys, you saw, you saw defenders doing quite a good job. Uh, De Gea pulled off a fucking fabulous save towards the end of the game that kind of kept us in the game and allowed us to kind of win anyway in general because it was no no at that time. You see the defenders doing a good job of keeping, uh, of stopping young boys from scoring, but not necessarily doing a good job going forward. Like Shaw and Valencia were quite timid in their forward play. Uh, Shaw had some opportunities to kind of go forward, but did, was quite wasteful. So you see them do a good job of defending. You see them, the midfielders doing one job where they're trying to pass the ball to each other and move the ball around. And then you see the attackers trying to make things happen at the end. It kind of reminds me of like Sunday League football. Like there's some, the gap is so wide between the back four uh, the middle, f the 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 midfield three and the front three. It's just massive. It's huge. You can't it, you can't escape how big of a chasm it is. And there's no real rhyme or reason or method of play that kind of joins all of us together. It doesn't really work. It's just like the attackers try and cross the ball, float balls in, do a little one two outside the area to score. The midfielders try and pass the ball in around amongst them, and defenders try and defend. It's just like a absolute clusterfuck of a situation. So that doesn't work. And probably as a sad, it's more of a bad indictment on Mourinho than it is of the players because there's a they're, they're definitely being set up wrong. Or they de or Mourinho's not doing a good enough job in in um, kind of getting his message across, and um, 
what else here Mino celebrating I didn't really get that it was a bit cringe I don't really I don't really I'm not really that annoyed by it um if anything it shows it shows even though he tries to pretend like it's not his fault he tries to deflect um fault he tries to always blame the players he always tries to point the finger back at the press whenever they question his methods and saying they didn't know what they're talking about and if it's so easy why don't you try it kind of insinuating that sort of thing even though he does all these di um the diversion tactics or deflecting tactics that smashing of the um lucas eight bottles whatever they may be on the, on the floor did prove that he is under pressure He's feeling the pressure. He knows his job's on the line, for real, for real. And he knows that if he loses his job at United, then it's more an indictment on his coaching style than it is of United being run poorly. We are run poorly. I think the whole world knows we're run poorly. But I think Mourinho's um, prowess or Mourinho's powers as a manager will show that they're starting to wane. Because what effectively his failure in United is proving is that without the money, without the infrastructure, he can't perform. He can't do the job that a lot of people thought he could do, where he could come into a club and kind of put the pieces into play, which is very hard to do. It's not a really, it's not, it's, it's a talent that I, I think a lot of people underestimate how difficult it is to do. I think it's a lot more easy to be a coach, just to come in and handle the football side of it, right? Not even the football business, the football side of it, right? Let alone the operational side of the business of, of football. But just to do, be a coach is probably a lot more hard, a lot more easier and comes up more natural to most um, football managers because that's what they fell in love with the game with, right? But to be a coach. But in this current era that we're living in, or this, we got we got split. We got some managers who come in and just be the coach and we got some managers who come in and are asked to kind of, learn, you know, um, use the club as a blank canvas and just do as they please. And unfortunately, Mourinho was kind of given a blank canvas and didn't really know what to do. Right, especially when they weren't the football people at the club that he thought he needed. Right, Ed Woodward is is a lot of things, but he's not football people. Right, so you've got a club that has a lot of aging um, players on the books, a lot of players who've been given long contracts who shouldn't been given long contracts, um, a lot of just like you know uh, round pegs for square holes and stuff. So he had a lot of work to to kind of reconstruct or rebuild that team, that club overall, and he failed. So that will be a real dent to his ego if he loses his job because of that because it will definitely highlight just how far behind he slipped at the current era now it would be amazing if he could leave united or in the process of the end of the season he could kind of realize you know what maybe to change my ways and and do this and do that in order to kind of get us back where you need to get to but i don't think he's going to do that he's too set in his ways and if anything he's been proven right here and there right he gets a victory away at home at Juventus when no one thought we were going to win we win last minute against young boys even though playing shit we get through the Champions League. Like he, he's, he keeps giving, he keeps, he keeps giving, um, he gets these false feedback loops that keep kind of reaffirming his um, stubbornness. So it's hard for him to change, I think, because, you know, we haven't fallen flat on our face just yet. We're like, stum we're stumbling over, you know? We're that guy in Liverpool Street Station who's kind of coming back home after a work night out and he's had way too much to drink and he's walking like a zombie. Like he's, he looks like he's about to fall over, but he's got that drunk balance, you know, where even when he's just about to tip over, he's kind of, body you know his body gets him back on balance again uh, uh, uh. that's where we are until we fall flat on our face i don't think anyone kind of realize just how far behind we've fallen uh, um, what else his post-match interviews yeah man he's just a fucking prick isn't it really he's creating a bit of a shit atmosphere i think if anything those interviews got to prove that you know some people say oh the players are getting paid enough and they should just perform they get paid money i think that interview goes to prove it because you know if you work in a, in a workplace where you don't like the manager Look how hard it is just to kind of look at them in the eye, right? Or how hard it is to take their advice seriously when you don't like them. Let alone play for a football manager. Let alone train with them five days a week and hear him kind of chew you out in public. It's not good, man. The atmosphere obviously is toxic. He doesn't, it's not, and he's got his favourites in the team, in the squad, like Matt Titch, who he never drops ever, even though they're playing, they've been playing shit for the best part of a year, right? He's got his favourites, like Fellaini, who always plays or who always gets opportunity to try and play. Who's always his kind of go-to plan B, which, you know, effectively worked out for him this time round. So there's obviously a toxic environment in that team where the ones that are, are for or indifferent about Mourinho are on one side and the ones that have had these clear clashes and have butted heads with him on the other side. What do you expect is going to happen? And then those interviews just further exasperate that sort of stuff, right? It's just one of those kind of round, round, round we go situations. But yeah, I don't, I don't know when it's going to change. Um... Hopefully, very very soon. I'm assuming if we don't get the Champions League qualifications, they'll sack him. I'm assuming if it ends that way, that's when he'll go. Um, I'm assuming that. I don't think it's going to happen, though, um, because I just think, you know, our club is just fucking brain dead. And they're going to look at it like, oh, who else should we get? There's no available person. Why don't we get someone that knows about football, that can actually go out there and scour 
Europe or the world for an actual manager that's actually going to make us play attractive football. Doesn't necessarily need to be someone with a heavy CV, but let's go and actually pluck someone out. Like, you know, an actual good manager. Let's not go for the obvious. Like, oh, let's go for Zidane. Why? Like, why? Why are we going for Zidane? Because he managed Real Madrid. Because he's one of their best players. Because he won a, a champion, two Champions Leagues with one, arguably one of the best squads in the world, with, with including Ronaldo. Like, come on, man. This is nuts, bro. Like, really? Is that what we're doing? We're going to go and sack Mourinho because he couldn't manage an entire club and then we're going to ask Zidane to do that when he hasn't done that at Real Madrid. He works only Florentino and Perez who's basically the guy running the ship at that place, right? And he just basically coaches the players. All the commercial aspects of the of the brand, of the brand are completely off um, um, Zidane's table. He just has to coach those players. Just, not just, but he has to, you know, do the training sessions, get them into shape and manage them during match days. And he expects to come into United and do a good job. Like, come on, man. That's, that's not going to work. Like, But anyway, what do I know? Let's say about that the better. You no, know, it just gets you angry and pissed off. Um, Ortiz and Chuck Liddell. Jesus Christ. What a shit show that was, right? So Oscar De La Hoya's first fight promotion. It's a, this Oscar De La Hoya dude's a bit of a weirdo, isn't it? Right? Imagine that being your first fight promotion. That you put on a fight with Oscar De La Hoya and Chuck Liddell. Two aging, 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 aging MMA fighters. And... <coughs> Uh, let me just find it here, Chuck Liddell. And it's um, it's sad, man, because you know, I've only got I've only got into MMA and UFC recently, so I don't really, I've not really got the backlog to see um where these guys have come from. But I've watched YouTube videos and seen how much of a force of nature Chuck Liddell was, and his prime, the power in his fist was just a, you know way too much back in the day. But you know, the game evolves, he gets older, blah blah blah, blah. it ends, and you think you know that's it, it's gonna be over, we're not gonna see this shit show again, but. For some reason, someone thought it was a good it was a good idea to get these two people in a ring again, these aging MMA fighters, right, and subject them to I don't know to this absolute shit show of an occasion. And if anything, it highlighted to me um, just why I love MMA and UFC. It's a shit show. Don't get me wrong; it was embarrassing. Everyone involved should be embarrassed, as Brendan Schaub said. Um, I think for the most part, Chuck Liddell coming out afterwards and saying that he felt good and he see what's going to happen next is probably him just you know still suffering from a concussion. Um, no one in his team should allow him to fight ever again. Um, I know he might not have anything else on on his plate that he wants to do that's making him any sort of money and he's getting nervous. But the MMA community should find out a way that's going to allow this guy not to put himself through this again because he just, he just looks absolutely shot. He looks so slow. It's unbelievable how slow he looked in that ring. Um, he kind of looked like, you know, he kind of looked, he kind of looked like what I looked like when I went to my Groupon class for Mo Muay Thai, right? You just so awkward. You don't know what you're doing. You're like, you know, what do you do? Step, step, rev, step, step, rev. You know what I mean? You're like so, so awkward. That's what you kind of look like. But yeah, that's the knockout um, that Tito Ortiz um, as well was kind of cringe, you know, celebrating as if like, I don't know, he beat John Jones in his prime or some shit. Like Chuck does got to chill out. But I guess, you know, that's Chuck's, um, what you call it? That's his selling point, isn't it? Being the cringe lord. But yeah, th th this knockout did go, did for me prove, oh no, it's a good analogy for football in general and how I see the current situation at United. I think MMA and UFC, I love it because the, when the game progresses or when the game evolves, it's just, it just evolves. You can't hunk, you can't um, romanticize about old times. You can't um, go in there and say, I'm going to prove um, these new guys wrong and show them that you can just go in there and beat most people just just jujitsu. The game has advanced so far nowadays that you just can't be good at one thing. You have to be the master, if not an expert, at various at, at uh, um in different um arenas of martial arts. Like you have to be an expert in Muay Thai, an expert in kickboxing, an expert in I don't know grappling, an expert in wrestling, an expert in judo, jiu-jitsu, um, any other form of striking. You have to be an expert level of these things and try and combine them in some way, shape or form. It's just insane. Nowadays it's a bit better, I think, for kids coming up because you know they've got actual MMA gyms with ex MMA fighters who have come from various different stages of their career to kind of teach her in a gym. So they're able to kind of impart some of their wisdom and kids coming up are now learning how to fight MMA, all right? When that wasn't really a thing back in the day, people used to do people used to go to MMA gyms, but not to learn MMA, they also learn maybe a specific thing or whatever it may be. But I think that evolution from the fighters, from the coaching, from the nutrition, from the mindset, you only have to listen to 
the guys that come on Joe Rogan's MMA Hour or um, Eric Hawani's show, um, some of the coaches and some of the people being involved in the back room and some people that are involved in organizing the fights, the game's really stepped up a level. And um, there's no going back. You just can't turn back the uh, clock of father time. And also in MMA, when you get old or when the clock starts running down and your father time starts knocking on your door, yeah, he's going to he's gonna come in. Like there's no way you, you can avoid that uh, not coming at your door. It's not going to happen. And um, unfortunately, football, it's not the same sort of thing, right? Like you look at the Arsene Wenger situation, no one could put him out of his misery. He had to put himself out of his misery. In the end, if you believe the rumours, he was going to get fired anyway. So you kind of jump before he got fired. Didn't want to be embarrassed. But... For years, he was fucking stinking up Arsenal. For years. Everyone knew he was stinking up the place. Um, the players were resting on, their, resting on their laurels. Arsenal were not performing at the level they needed to perform. And everyone just knew that, you know, as soon as you change that manager, because they had a good enough team overall to kind of sustain a good level, they'll be, you know, they'll be challenging again. And guess what happened? They changed the manager. They got Una Emery, one of the probably, you know, complete polar opposite of Wenger in terms of his intensity levels or what he demands from his players, uh, level of professionalism and stuff. And you're seeing a, a completely different team. Now, a lot of that's to do with, not all of that's to do with age, but just to do with the game evolving. Just evolved. It's just moved on. So, Chuck Liddell, just moved on. The game's moved on. Like, it's just moved on. You guys are old news. Just leave it. Hang it up. Like, go. Um, and you've seen that a lot. But in football, it doesn't really happen that way. There's a lot of, like, you know, enablers out there, right? Oh, Marino's all right. He's won trophies, da, 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 da. But it's like, let's look at all the teams around the world. Most managers that are managing these teams that are playing really attractive football haven't won that much. Outside of like Pep Guardiola and some of the others, right? They haven't really much won a lot. Most of them are just playing in a very attractive brand of football that's exciting fans, that's making them want to come to the stadium, that's enticing players to join their teams because they know they're going to be part of this team that is going to be able to make good YouTube compilation for them, for them right? If you're an attacking player. Um, but why would you join United to do what? To, to play long balls into Fellaini so he's gonna, he can knock it down and handball it and score? Like, that's not the best way you want to play. <laughs> So, yeah, that's why I love MMA UFC. I love that correlation. But, yeah, sad to see Chuck Liddell go out that way or Lidl, as they like to call him, Lidell. Um, but hopefully this is the end now and he can kind of, you know, gracefully bow out because he's, he, you know, he's contributed a lot to um, UFC and to the MMA community overall. He, he deserves a kind of, just just a rest and chill, man. I don't, there needs to be someone that's able to kind of help these guys out and put them up to, to something. Because at the moment, that's just shocking that he's able that people are passing in fit to fight. Uh, oh, it's just insane. Insane. Watching that fight was really sad. I just felt sad for him. I felt sad for everyone involved, personally. Like, the moment he walked into the ring, you knew he wasn't He wasn't off to the races. But anyway, what can we do? What can we do? Next on the list of topics here is fashion's notoriously controlling luxury brands are bringing everything they can in-house, which to me sounds like the fashion world is taking a l so many lessons from streetwear but doesn't want to take knowledge it's annoying isn't it right so there's this there's been a, there's a bit, let me get up on the screen quick so you can see what i'm talking about there you go it's from the fashion law um fashion notoriously controlling luxury brands are busy bringing everything they can in house i'll link all these uh, articles in the notes so you can check it out but there's been a weird um, sort of like sea turn within fashion, right? There was a there was a time when the fashion community never wanted to acknowledge streetwear, right? They wanted to kind of poo-poo it. They didn't really want to embrace the figures that were coming from that community, whether it's a Kanye West, whether it's a Virgil. They were kind of getting shunned and, you know, being placed on the periphery of the scene. Um, everyone was kind of romanticizing about editors and all stylists and those kind of magazines and stuff. But for the most part, we all knew where the real energy was. So that's all like hip hop, right? Remember, hip hop was declared the, the world's most popular music genre. We all kind of like, duh. Yeah, we all knew that was true because we all go around the world. We all intermingle with, or we all work with people from all different parts of the world. And one thing that could join us f together or that could unite us was the power of hip hop, as cringe as it may sound, right? We knew hip hop was popular because we heard it everywhere. So we know streetwear was popular because we've seen the streetwear motifs being adopted in the streets, right? People taking high fashion items and kind of incorporating them into their kind of everyday wear, which is kind of, you know, the quintessential streetwear look, right? Or, you know, goes to describe what streetwear is to the common consumer, maybe to us fans. Streetwear can maybe, um, is about representing an image, right? Where it comes to hats, hoodies, t-shirts, jeans, and trainers. Or whether it's come from an ascension from the skateboarding world, wherever it may be, but we knew what was going on. We knew streetwear was the was the thing, and fashion needed to catch up to us instead of us catching up to fashion. 
it happened the, the sea change happened the light switch flicked on virgil and kanye and co were welcomed with welcome arms into the fashion community which spawned a whole generation of fashion um, designers such as the demler at balenciaga and vertima that are kind of championing this new wave of designers that are kind of infiltrating the fashion scene and becoming the real voices that are kind of spearheading the change um that is now being adopted into many different brands right you're seeing celine um during felipe Fibre, Fibre, era incorporating or making her own version of an air force one um you've seen uh you see the good the great work that ricardo tisha did at Givenchy. you see um the stuff that um, rick owens has been doing for years and years um you're seeing all these kind of big designers taking all these straight motifs and adding them like you know actual um talented um, designers and pattern cutters that are taking these motifs and adding them into their fashion lineage and it's kicking off a storm which is then only adding more eyes to the streetwear world people are looking at thinking hmm if they're taking these ideas from streetwear there must be some people in that community behind these ideas who are also doing great work tap it you tap into virgil hiring him at louis vuitton and bob's your uncle granny's your aunt right it's, it's all we're off to the races but now it's changed again where the fashion community are getting pissed off and annoyed at the whole streetwear thing and they're kind of trying to move away from it. And now they're trying to um, manufacture this new wave of tailoring, of tailoring, right? That's been a new thing happened this past uh, spring, summer 19. Oh, it's a return to tailoring, return to tailoring, which is kind of dog whistles are saying that get those fucking streetwear guys out of our out of our shows and the front rows and get all Emmanuel uh, Alt and all those kind of um, um, folk from Vogue Paris back on the front row, right? Because we need it because, you know, we don't see those people being covered anymore, which is weird, isn't it, right? You see more of, um, which is which must be a weird ego, weird, weird ego then if you're those people. You see more pictures of like, I forgot what that mixed girl's name is that's always wearing... Um, nice clothes i forgot her name but you see more images of those kind of people right those kind of um ins again there's another one i mentioned too uh, in my head i can't forgot the name but anyway you see more of those kind of girls those kind of you know usually you know latino uh black uh girls who are kind of really cool and dress really well being covered on social media going to these fashion shows then you do the the fashion glitterati, you know, the kind of actual editors of these big, uh, big fashion magazines like Emmanuel Alt, who's, you know, the fashion director at Vogue Paris. You you see less of those people, even, um, even, uh, not Anna Winter, what's her fucking name? From CR C magazine? Kareem Reutfeld. You see less of those kind of likes than you do of the actual streetwear influencer type people who are invited to fashion shows, which is a real sea change. So a lot of that thing is kind of manufactured in order to kind of get those people, their seats back again, right? Because they're feeling a little bit ostracized. They feel as the street where people are kind of taking their jobs per se. But some of the things that fashion could learn from streetwear is this direct-to-consumer model, right? This idea that I can make a collection, I can uh, tease it, I can leak a few um, behind-the-scenes shots, I can um, publish or send a lookbook to Hypebeast and Heist Nobai. They can run it on their site for a week. And then I can drop it the following Thursday. Like I can, I can, I can just launch stuff like when I want to, right? I can make a capsule collection and it can be out in two weeks. Like streetwear, don't fuck around, right? Because everything is direct to consumer for the most part. They might have distribution, they might have some resellers they fuck with, but for the most part, most streetwear brands have an online store, which is not the same for fashion brand, which is fucking nuts, right? Some fashion brands don't have an actual online store where you can buy stuff from them. You have to go to a retailer and then buy it from that retailer and hope the retailer has the thing that you want because not everything that's made on the runway gets made. It's nuts, which doesn't happen that much in streetwear, really. For the most part, what you see in lookbooks is available, right? It's, you can buy it. Even if it hasn't made it retailers, you can usually email the designer. Um, in, in this area, you could probably tag the designer if you're um, that way inclined on Instagram and shit and, show, and, you know, and tell them how passionate you are about the brand. I'm sure someone will be able to work something out for you because they'll be like, oh, wow, you took an interest in a piece that I love, but, you know, the consumers didn't love too much. And they'll be more than happy to kind of hook you up, I'd assume, right? But that idea that you can actually buy everything a streetwear brand makes is something that's completely foreign to a fashion brand like it's sort of like a privilege to buy some stuff from a fashion brand because the stuff isn't made not a privilege in terms of scarcity of um, um quant uh, scarcity of items like supreme but just because you know this, they hardly make things so in order, to, in order for you to get you know some oh, book fell down in order for you to get like a something from visvim sometimes i mean back in the day now it's better because you know they probably got more retailers and can probably manufacture more things but back in the day just getting a piece from visvim was a big deal like some of the stuff that wasn't you know the the, the obvious pieces like the denim jacket that wasn't the fbts um that wasn't a backpack if it was just like a, a i don't know a long sleeve that you liked in a lookbook or like a cool bucket hat 
or like a bat or like a tote bag or some shit. Just getting it was a big deal because it didn't make that many of them, right? Um, and fashion is even worse because they just don't make the item flat out. But it's good to see from this article on fashion law that some fashion companies are now starting to adopt um, the business models that streetwear companies are using. Even if fashion law doesn't say they're taking it true, I think they are because what they're doing is that they're bringing all their all their operations in-house which is weird as well that fashion companies do this right like they outsource so much shit it's un it's un it's it's, it's just it's just such a backwards way of working um especially when you can do most things from the comfort of your laptop but i'll read some of the article because i thought it was quite interesting but it does go to show there's a kind of a bit of a sea change happening now in the industry overall and hopefully it continues uh, let me get up on the screen here so um fashion notoriously did there so for the past six years um yoke's uh, Netta Porter Kering have engaged in a powerful partnership by way of a joint venture. The London-based lu luxury platform powered the individual e-commerce platforms uh, for seven of, of, of Kering's fashion brands, including Saint Laurent, Balenciaga, Bottega Veneta, and amongst others, with the exception of Kering's marquee brand Gucci, which remains separate. According to Vogue, Kering initially enlisted. Um, uh, YNAP services to help power the online retail platform for its labels during a time when it was still carving out a strategy. Imagine using them to power. It's like pff, people can just set up a Shopify account and just sell clothes. Big cartel, sell clothes. Squarespace, sell clothes. It's nuts, isn't it? Right? Um, what? The, and and I'm assuming there's loads of um, there's loads of uh, because I remember there was, that's what the article with Kylie Jenner saying that she was a billionaire, right? Because um, she kept her kind of overheads quite low. Um, I think she only has like three or four em actual employees and everything else gets outsourced in terms of manufacturing and all that malarkey. But for the most part, the, op the business operation can just be run from a laptop. Um, uh, with that in mind, the decision to bring its digital op operations in-house is a natural step, which most streetwear brands have, right? They don't they don't hire people. They just Everything is all in-house or you get friends to help you out, but you don't hire, you don't just like outsource digital shit like because you can just do it from your laptop the industry's key players are increasingly building up their own technology teams in an effort to maintain complete control of the branding marketing and sell their products as well as to enjoy full and unencumbered access to available information such as client data which is amazing right because especially nowadays in the in the era of um data protection acts or privacy acts or that malarkey um it, the only way that you're going to be that you're going to be allowed to ethically um you know request or keep anyone's data is if you have if you have the user come to your site directly and purchase from you, right? Then, you know, in the process of that transaction, you can somehow, you know, f finagle a way of extracting their data from them because, you know, you're ex you're exchanging in some sort of exchange or something, right? But if they're buying it from a third-party retailer, then why should they be handing over that? Why should that third-party retailer be handing over third-party information back to the brand? It doesn't It doesn't sound right. It is a bit of a sour taste in the mouth. So maybe that's they're only doing is put their back. But overall, it's just like, wow, man, how weirdly stuck in the, um, you know, in the olden days, in the in the in the old times where these fashion brands that they had to now decide, you know, maybe it's a good idea that we bring all our digital presence in house, like. Jesus Christ. Um, the article continues. Um, the conclusion of the YNAP Caring Joint Venture, which is expected to formally wind down in the first half of 2020, but we'll see Caring continue stock is brands. Comes a year after Caring appointed eBay veteran, which makes sense why they're doing it. Uh, Gregory Botue, Botua or Bote as his chief client and digital officer, a role in which he will lead the, group, um, the group's digital transformation and thrive the development of e-commerce. Meanwhile, Kevin's closet, um, uh, closet rival, uh, LVMH, uh, which plays a parent, um, who plays parent to Louis, uh, Louis Vuitton, Dior, Celine, and Givenchy, among others, has been briefing up digital presence. The, the Paris-based conglomerate launched its own multi-brand website, uh, two, 22 veils really okay cool last year under the watch of Ian Rogers the former Apple executive who joined um, LVMH in 2015 so everyone is making that change it's good to see I'm interested to see what they're going to do with Virgil and his Louis Vuitton collection because um, he comes from he comes from our school of just getting stuff online and being a digital kid so it's going to be very interesting how they're going to be able because i know they did the first drop and they had that little pop-up in mayfair that went really well and looked amazing i kind of previewed some of the pieces uh, before in another video um but i was interested to see how they're going to approach the selling of products that virgil puts out consistently for louis vuitton men's because a lot of it is going to need to be sold online because they could sell some of those bags and trunks and stuff and the glasses and the key rings they could sell that stuff like 
day in day out online without without any hassle some of the stuff that's going to kind of kind of probably go in line right i'm assuming some of the trainers accessories could easily sell like you know on a daily basis online so i want to see how they're going to approach it you know would they want to do that are they afraid to do it because they might cheapen their brand i don't know but i hope most brands do that and again pay homage man pay homage all these um fashion commentators and uh, fashion blogs and stuff want to uh, you know push themselves away from streetwear for some reason right um but they want to then adopt the business models that streetwear has pioneered and kind of led the way with um doesn't make any sense to me personally but um hey what can you do sometimes when someone steps inside your room you feel as if they're going to take it over when all they want to do is play with you a couple games on your computer console weird analogy but i think it works um <laughs> what's next what's next on the day 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 um h&m closes cheap monday yeah did you hear about this h&m shutters cheap monday i know some of you are crying into your um uh, what do people that wear cheap monday drink crying into your cans of dr pepper right but um cheap monday is no longer going to be around for the most part it's because of poor sales um but it does necessarily it does kind of you know represent a change in taste um i can't get the thing up because it's a fucking bof exclusive article but it's available here on business of fashion um i should actually sign up because i'm always what fucking reading this website anywhere as it is right i should actually become a member but like with the new york times you don't want to become a member of these sites you just want to you just want to read it for free um but anyway um this is a headline um business of fashion right now at the moment i can't read it unfortunately because it's behind a paywall but it says h&m is to close a struggling cheap monday brand mostly because of poor sales but um i'd say a lot of it might have to do again with the kind of changing climate or the chain a change in aesthetic right because cheap monday i remember when i used to wear it back in the day was you know when it was cool to wear skinny jeans nowadays it's not the cool thing to do it's not trendy um as a trend forecaster would like to say um I think, you know, if you want to wear skinny jeans, you can. That look is still amazing to me. I love big baggy hoodies with skinny jeans and big shoes. I think that contrast just works so well. And I think for someone like that's as tall as I am, has as long legs as I do, I think it's quite a good way to, you know, um, to look cool without trying too hard, right? It doesn't require that much effort to put on some nice skinny jeans, a big hoodie and a t-shirt underneath that has a bit of pop to it. Um, but nowadays, unfortunately, the the kind of silhouette has changed somewhat and kids are now wearing, I'm a, I'm a good example of that, are now wearing um, bigger pants, bigger trousers. I wear massive camo trousers, massive construction pants. Um, and I feel weird when I have to wear my normal blue denim jeans that are a bit more sm slimmer or uh, a smaller waist than the other trousers I buy. Like I'm purposely going out and buying trousers that are like a 38 waist when I'm a, when I'm a 34. It doesn't make any sense, but I just want to wear a big bag of, tr bag of trousers, which if you told me that when I was working in Dr. Martin's on Carnaby Street back in the day and I was a fucking um, sales assistant and I was walking up and down Carnaby Street with my skinny jeans and my big boots feeling cool. If you'd have told me that, Back in the day, uh, that uh, you know, I don't know, five, six, seven years later, I'll be wearing um, two times the sizes of my jeans, trousers, in order to kind of look cool. I'll slap you in the face, but it's actually happened. So that's fucking weird. Um, but yeah, I just think it's a changing climate. Kids nowadays don't want to wear skinny jeans; they want to wear big, baggy trousers and look cool. And kind of, and it's the only way, especially now when all the trainers are really, really big or really stacked. And everyone wants to kind of look cozy and that kind of whole tailored pleated pant look is kind of really in wide leg um and maybe it'll change or come come back around again but that makes sense and plus the other brands in the kind of h&m empire um such as weekday are probably a lot more stronger and cause than cheap monday because i'm imagine the sales that cause and weekday do in comparison to cheap monday just must, it must be insane already i think i don't know i don't really see that many girls wearing monkey but monkey's been quite is a bit good chameleon brand too like and like and other stories as well they do a good job as well of, you know they just go kind of go with the wave of what's happening they're not maybe as blatant as zara zara when you go online and you look especially not their men's because their men's is, is, is full of shit but when you go in their women's it's usually quite a good um representation of the fashion climate right at the moment so when you go on a women's site you can kind of see a bit of a theme going on on zara on zara no you sorry you can't see a theme it's usually a patchwork of shit it's usually like the best valentino thing the best Celine thing the best saint laurent thing and it just kind of hot pot you in but and other stories i think and cause do a good job of like taking what they see on the runway as inspiration quote unquote and adopting it in their own line but kind of like making a full collection out of it as opposed to just like loads of different little things like you know when I remember when Vetamon were out, um, when it first came out, where they were popping, like you go on the Zara website and it'll be like, 
fake vet like their version of a vetamon floral dress thing next to um you know something that heidi did at saint laurent you know next to something that rick owens did it's just like still make any sense but yeah cheap monday um you were gone and not forgotten came around during a good era when i was banging to indie music and i thought i was cool but you know these things have to come to an end but it'll be, it'll be interesting to see what happens if like it was interesting to see if like skinny jeans go out like disco leggings you remember when was the era when everyone all the girls are wearing a cheap monday disco leggings they're the ones that you know shiny and show off your bum it'll be funny to see if cheap monday jeans die like disco leggings or they never come back or if they end up just being a thing that dies but then comes back later like flares right or like baggy jeans right they're just like corduroy like corduroy trousers like i used to have to wear those in church when i was in school and i hated them but now they come back again so i didn't see what happens if they kind of go out and then come back or if they just kind of go out completely um what else is on the list um oh nike collabs nike 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 collab so nike have been fucking ramping up the collaborations lately right and i'm sure most of you guys have noticed um everyone everyone and their mum is getting a fucking nike collaboration right it's just coming they come they're just fucking pumping them out it seems if every influencer that has got any kind of clout online or any sort of following or influencers kind of being tapped in to get another collaboration if you're gary vaynerchuk you're going to be like oh oh duh this should happen ages ago if you're a savvy consumer you might think they're kind of oversaturating the market somewhat um you kind of feel as if like you know some of them are you know worthy of collaborations some of them make sense but then some of it kind of it's a bit weird look of it like you know um you look at like hmm what's that all about like the Nigel Sylvester and Jordan brand collaboration you know he's a he's been a force of nature on the BMX um someone who's probably single-handedly um taken BMX culture and made it pop overall um but should he be having a Jordan brand collaboration I don't know um should it look the way it looked I don't know whatever it may be but then on the back of it everyone else is getting collaborations but I think the good thing about it, the great thing, I think, in general, is that Nike have finally started to realize that a lot of their power and influence comes from these influencers or leaders within their own little, um, you know, area of expertise kind of championing their products and also having a say in what they do for the future. Now, Nike have one of the best innovation labs in the world, right? Some of the shoes that they come out with are just insane. You only have to look at the Nike Reacts lately and just think, you know, no other brand in the world could make that shoe, right? And make it and make it pop as it did, right? In such an organic way where every model that comes out um sub subsequently has been sold out. Uh, I think the undercover version haven't even come out yet, right? The React 87s and the Chuckers now are now becoming a bit of a thing that people are wearing. I'm seeing a lot of people post out online and the Nike two the Nike Air two two seven E was another good example. Nike can just make great shoes, right? But they also need um, um, key figures within the culture or within the scene to also champion them. So the only way to kind of get these guys on board is to kind of allow them in house and allow them to kind of make some stuff, right? Because back in the day, they will kind of shun people away and just give seed them products. But that's not enough, right? People want some type of ownership. People want to have their name added onto the creative timeline of whatever this thing is that we call the scene. They want to be, they want to go from being a consumer to being a maker. They want to go from being, you know, want someone standing in line to being the one conducting the line. People want involvement. And the way to kind of, and also the way to kind of sell product um, in a very crude sense is to get the people that, um, the kind of buyers look up to and get them to kind of do collaborations or front collaborations. That's a way to kind of sell loads of products. So selling faceless product um, is only going to work so much, but getting, you know, reputable people such as Tom Sachs, such as Virgil um, to be involved, or such as Matthew Williams from At Elix to kind of get involved. Speak again, so you have people to do a Latin collaboration is only going to add to the law of what Nike are, are doing. And this season or this year has not been any any different. And we've seen uh, collaborations now, automation. we've seen a collaboration leaked or uh, rumored, or sorry, teased from Yoon of Ambush. We've seen Heron Preston's doing collaboration, which is really interesting because he's not even doing shoes, he's doing sunglasses. We've seen a Cold War doing a collaboration with um, shoes and clothing. We've seen Fear of God doing the same thing. We've seen Martin Rose so far uh, show us a track jacket. Um, we've, we heard there's rumors supposedly of a whole conglomerate of other ladies involved in the uh, fashion industry or in the streetwear or in the scene industry getting involved in doing some collaborations such as uh, Sarah um, Edelman a former formerly known as Sarah Collette doing a collaboration Virgil's supposed to be signed on to do more collaboration with Nike it's great to see but the funny thing is that maybe this has all come as a head um, off the back of the whole uh, uh, debacle with Kanye 
Kanye, for all the ills and wrongs that he's done, I think for the scene overall, he's been an absolute force of nature. He's allowed so many people to actually have a career within the scene, right? He's been instrumental in getting people positions, in, in giving them platforms. Um, he's just been a great force that people only, haven't really realised. We only realise, you know, in times gone by, just how much he's done for the scene overall. But I think letting letting Kanye go to Nike was probably one of Nike's biggest missteps ever in the history of the brand. Like, it goes without a shadow of a doubt. Yes, their their uh, relationship was strained. Yes, Kanye is not probably the easiest person to work with, especially during that time. I mean, he was going through a lot of conflicts because he wasn't necessarily getting the creative freedoms that he wants. He wasn't necessarily getting the monetary rewards that he thought his talents deserved, which kind of created a lot of anxiety, a lot of turmoil, which we kind of saw come to head when he went on that Zane Lowe interview. He felt like he was owed a lot more than what he was given. Um, he was creating work at the highest level and he wasn't necessarily getting compensated for it or, or rewarded well for it. And Nike were kind of kind of caught in the crossfires um, for, the, for, for, the, for the most part of it right it wasn't necessarily their fault just they just came around the wrong sort of time but letting go letting go of Kanye or letting him go to their bitter rivals hey this was a big 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 fuck up and what they couldn't afford to happen was for Kanye to dictate the conversation and to make it seem as if Nike were the bad guys and everyone to be like fuck Nike fuck Nike and then for all the influence and all the brand people to go you know what I'm not wearing Nikes and I'm gonna burn my Nikes and follow Kanye or follow whoever other influencer anywhere else but Nike and that could have easily happened right the industry has that power if Nike kept shitting on influencers and not and not giving them a chance to do collaborations that weren't just changing colorways and wouldn't give an opportunity to kind of do um to kind of you know talk on panels or to kind of be consultants if if nike wouldn't give these kids the the that open the door to them they could have revolted quite easily and just kind of you know killed that brand overnight it, it, i know it sounds crazy it sounds out of the world but honestly i think nike recognize just how much power they have as a brand and how much power these collective influencers all over the world have as a brand and just bring it together would just it's just a no-brainer especially the ones especially the brands that they've collaborated with, i've read off they've all got rep in the scene they've all people that everyone kind of by the, by the most part everyone everyone kind of rates everyone respects they've kind of paid their dues they put in their ten thousand hours they're all creating very unique and amazing and plus when i think about it too that list is fucking amazing because none of those brands are the same like none of them are the same like not even close they all look completely different from their color palettes to their design codes um to just their general aesthetic like it's all completely different so it was only it, it just made sense oh and i didn't even mention matthew williams for leaks he's got collaboration coming out too like it only made sense to kind of get that to align that power with those influences and so far we haven't seen a lot we haven't seen the full range i think except for maybe heron press and the cold war and fear of god i want to quickly go through some of the stuff that i thought was quite cool um so far i think yoon has been kind of teasing some of the stuff that she's been doing with her brand with her collaboration that looks amazing and i think it's a good it's a good as well um She's quite a good person, especially for the women in streetwear who are usually underrepresented. I think she's a good person also to kind of spearhead one of the first collaborations to drop out of that kind of uh, conglomerate or that kind of group because she's got a very particular aesthetic too. She's somebody that's been involved in the scene for such a long, 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 long time. And I just think in general, she's going to approach it in a more interesting way than, you know, your conventional, you know, um, trainers and you know supreme cap wearing person would so i'm i'm eager to see the stuff that she's going to put out and so far um looking at the teasers it all looks very very interesting most of it is from stuff that i've seen on instagram so uh please bear with me but yeah uh this first piece that i saw on instagram looked very very cool what was it get this up here so you've got oh why didn't it come up here weird okay let's do this one this is a profile you so you got this that full look pretty cool and, and I'm sure, i saw the trainers too i don't know what the trainers are meant to look like but this looks fucking cool so it's like a, it looks like a some track pants with some elastic at the back and 3 m piping going all the way around um which is awesome i love that she used um ambush as well because i'm assuming that's the jewelry line name right um that she um runs with her husband verbal who we don't really see that much of these days isn't it i wonder what's happening there um but um hopefully he's involved in the collaboration somewhat but that looks pretty cool those piping in those pants that 3m hit looks fucking amazing um again for the for the ladies or even for the fellas that would be pretty cool to wear and nowadays everyone is wearing Everyone's kind of mixing and blending of the clothings anyway these days. A lot of people have to thank Celine for that as well, isn't it? There was an era where 
you know, it was really faux pas to wear women's clothing to get it in your size. Nowadays, like guys are ex- you know, going out and buying size 14, size 16 um, jackets or blouses from, you know, w- uh, ladies brands and wearing them because they're just far more interesting to wear than men's clothing sometimes. Um, so that looked pretty cool. That track pant and long sleeve combo there. Then we've got some new bits too. That's produced a UN preview too recently. Um, hopefully, um, that I love that chain. Um, I know Virgil done something similar as well with his Louis Vuitton collection. Um, and the, she's got the trainers there stacked, right? They kind of they sort of look a bit of like a sock with like a 180 saw, I'm assuming, there with that bubble. And again, the piping too looks amazing. So I can't wait to see that. That shirt's going to fucking fly out. If that's a shirt that's gonna that's gonna fly, so it's like a snaky swoosh with like ambush written on the bottom. That's gonna be such an easy uh, such an easy sell. And so according to some of the stuff I saw on Cold Wall retail store, some of the stuff is priced pretty pretty well. This Nike collaboration, so they're doing a good job in how they're pricing the stuff as well. I gotta be honest. And then um, this might be the trainers. I'm not too sure what the trainers are. Again, I'm not too sure what the trainers are gonna be, but they look very interesting too. So again, like a kind of sock shoe. Um, it looks like it's got 180 saw according to the 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 saw that I saw earlier, but I'm not too sure. So I'm eager to see what that looks like. So that's one collaboration that we've got coming up very very soon that I'm looking forward to seeing. And then the other one um, here that I'm just gonna actually get up and load because I think it might be a little more interesting to talk about um, was the Heron Preston collaboration. Um, who's you know I think it's fair to say I think he'd be fair to admit who's kind of had a meteoric rise. Um, someone who hasn't necessarily come from, he hasn't necessarily approached the scene as a, you know, my dream is to become, you know, the creative director of Louis Vuitton. Because I think even Virgil probably wouldn't admit it now because, you know, he's a little bit more um, stoic um, uh, nowadays than, than he may have been in his earlier career. But, you know, so Virgil, Virgil's obviously a very driven guy and had some very set plans in his head about where he saw his career going. And I think Louis Vuitton was probably one of the stepping stones he had to kind of go even further than that. But Heron Preston always felt like somebody like to me anyway, um, somebody that kind of like, like me, put, like me in some cases, who just kind of wanted to turn their lifestyle into a job, right? So it's kind of that kind of Aaron Bondaroff uh, method, uh, mantra where you just kind of want to turn your everyday lifestyle, the things that you do, the cool stuff that you get into, just get paid for it. And if that meant you were doing fashion, if that meant you were directing movies, if that meant you were making books, if that meant you were um, running an art gallery, if that meant you were making capsule collections, whatever it meant, like, it just meant just like surviving or living in the world and being free to travel and hang out with your friends by doing the stuff that you love to do. Um, and um, Heron Preston's kind of done that, but it's kind of gone weirdly. It's, it's, it's gone even more well than he would have ever imagined, where he's been now become a quasi ambassador for sustainable fashion. He now has his own brand with a, with a, with another kind of um sub label brand i forgot the name of it it kind of is uh basketball skateboards kind of like you know you can call it um you can call it a subsidiary but you can maybe call it a, a, just a brand itself that he kind of also runs now that's sold in selfridges so he's kind of gone he's could he's run the whole gamut and now news has kind of come out recently on hype piece that he's opened his first retail store in hong kong which is fucking insane as well to see like it's just gone exponentially well for him but his collaboration is quite interesting because um, he could have easily you know made a whole collection of clothing or of shoes of trainers like air force ones that he's always wearing and all that sort of malarkey but he decided to um, he decided to do sunglasses so he tried to take a completely different tact on it and you know uh, reintroduced these uh, sunglasses and i thought this story that he posted on his instagram was quite endearing actually of the whole journey of the creative journey you know sometimes these things doesn't feel like it's worth it it feels like you're doing something and no one's fucking listening or it feels as if you're, you're kind of running in mud but you know the if the end goal is somehow to kind of turn back around and you know in 10 years time be working for your former employer be working alongside your former employer as a partner making your own uh, sunglasses it's fucking cool so he says this story i posted i'm gonna post up here from instagram that i thought was very very interesting um which is the following as you can see here i think that's his dog that used to have i think might have died i think maybe i think that might be the one those, maybe the, those big doggies always talk about but yeah so this is the, this is the kind of post he posted on instagram recently i'm heron preston you can follow him at heron preston all one word on instagram it says the following i think that's interesting i think st- what's interesting about my my story of being one of nike's newest collaborations is the fact that i actually used to work for the company eight years ago 
That trans that translation from fan to employee changed my perspective of Nike and its products. Once I started to learn more about their philosophy, dedication to innovation, and focus on the athlete. Nike is a sneaker famous brand, and when I worked there, my curiosities exploded. I wanted to discover more of what the brand had to offer beyond footwear. One of those products I discovered and fell in love with were the Nike Tailwind performance glasses. I wore them nearly every day. They had interchangeable lenses with different colors and felt so innovative to me. I was actually um, hyped on something that wasn't a sneaker for once. This this is why I decided that for my first collaboration with Nike wasn't going to be a sneaker or apparel but an accessory. Laser focused on the very same style of glasses that made me proud to work for such an ambitious and fearless company. I'm happy to announce that of November 2000, November 29th, 2018, the world will finally get to experience the Nike Tailwind HP performance sunglasses dropping worldwide. Amazing, no? What an amazing story, man. So you get to see loads of pictures from him from old wearing the sunglasses and they should be coming out very, very soon. They look fucking banging. Like so, so, so banging. Um, I can't wait to see what they look like in IRL. Uh, again, could have easily done some shoes and trainers, right? And they would have sold like fucking hotcakes. Instead, he decides to design these amazing sunglasses. So they look fucking amazing. I can't wait to see them in real life. And again, if they're able to kind of drop in all these um, great activation pieces on running and shit or just of living in general, living a creative life, that would be a, such a cool thing. I think it would be a much cooler thing than just the clothing overall. But yeah. Just amazing, man. I love it. I fucking love it. I absolutely love it. I can't to get our hands on them. Hopefully, I'll be able to get a pair. But I'm assuming just because they're glasses and they're not trainers and stuff, and it'll be something easy to do. And again, I love the codes. You know, everyone, everyone's embedding their design codes into design. Like, you know, the tips. He's got his, obviously, the style written in um, Russian Silyric written on the inside of the case and the tips of the sunglasses. Or oh, what the tips are they called sunglasses? I don't know what that bit of it's called. Are in his signature kind of orange. So yeah, very, very, very well done collaboration overall. And I can't wait to, again, like I said, see that shit in IRL. And this is it shown in the um, fashion show just past recently as well. They look really cool here as well. So yeah, so probably there'll probably be some early samples that they were debuting on the runway. So that should be pretty cool to see. Um, so yeah, her impressions with collaborations, I absolutely loved. I thought that was absolutely amazing. Um, and then another one where I thought that was very, very special was a Cold War. Um, I'm a big fan of um, Samuel Ross. I think he's probably one of, one of a very, very, very special individual that we have um, gracing our streetwear scene climate at the moment. Um, he's got a very, very particular point of view that he's coming from. He's got a very particular aesthetic, the way he kind of runs his business overall, the way that crew moves as a unit is very admirable. I just think they're, they're just very, very interesting company to come from. And I just think there's so much more scope that they have to... There's so much room they have to grow that it's just scary how big they could end up being especially when you think about where they come from right um when it comes from you know seeing videos of um, samuel ross dipping dip dying shoes into a big bucket of ink in, in color dye in order to kind of have them ready for a runway collection like insane to see how far they've progressed from that to the recent one where they had like a performance art piece of a guy sort of exploding you know out of this like um fake box thing like it's just fucking insane to see that happening but yeah so he made the collaboration too of a cold war that was full clothing and shoes which looked absolutely banging and very very on brand with everything that a cold war do again something that's probably in development for a very very long time i'm assuming because it was done in a very 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 cool way so these pictures over here from hype from high snobiety but i'm putting them here on screen so you guys can see hopefully let me lower this down a little bit so yeah i thought this all looked really really amazing boom 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 so you got that yeah, some nice pants. Um, again, some little nice signature or cold wool pieces here where the back is shorter than the front. Little cinches here and there on the sleeves. You've got modular, uh, would you call it, mo I'll call it modular design, right? Modular design where you can kind of tear off pieces and add them onto different pieces of, of other clothing that you have attached to it with Velcro or clips or buttons and stuff. Nice sort of branding on the, on the outside. Um, and the trainers just look so banging. Nice little coat there again. Nice big fat pockets. Another pockets around remind me of that whole aesthetic with that um cold wool do with their jackets. Reminds me of that interview I remember reading from um Rick Owens where he mentioned that all these jackets and coats that he makes, he tries to make the pockets of the jackets big enough to fit um a sandwich in a book. You know, just the kind of essentials that an every an everyday urbanite would need, you know, traversing the city. And I think and I feel that sometimes a cold wool do the same sort of thing. Like the, the the pockets are just obscenely they're they're, they're they're kind of big that I like right where because I always carry shit on me 
So, you know, you've got like, you've got enough room here to fit a book, enough room here to fit a sandwich, to fit a drink, you know, a couple of protein bars, whatever. Like, just love the little nods in there. There has to be something, something has to, I'm sure Sammy has some sort of influence in that, in how big the, the pockets are and the functionality behind it, because that's really, really cool. I love that. Um, what do we have here? And then we have another jacket too. With a nice sort of extension bit at the bottom there. Very, very nice. Um, kind of reminds me a little bit of what um, the work that Aishimiyaki does in so jacket sometimes too. Or he does there. With nice caps. And yeah, overall, just a banging collection from a Cold War. Very, very, very well made. And this is a new logo. and I've not seen this before. Oh, no, they've done it soon before. So sort of like a Cold War with a regular font, but kind of elongated and stretched out. Really, really cool, man. I love it overall. And again, just because you show, just given the resources, like a Cold War's production or manufacturing story has improved so much, especially on the back of the investment that they received recently. Um, you've, you can see it already in the last two runway shows that they put together and some of the lookbooks and stuff. Um, you can see the fin the kind of finish is really, really improved. Um, and again, just give these guys, give these talented dudes resources, give them the ability to create and they will knock it out of the park. And, you know, you, you're given the keys to the Nike factory and you can just bring out this collection. It's not, I'm not surprised. But yeah, again, it's just super, super good. That entire look is amazing on this lady. Like, so good. So, so good. Jacket with buttons that open up on the sleeve. Um, it looks like this long sleeve top might be thermal, so it might be a good top to wear when running and stuff. Just absolutely love it. Love it. Love it, love it, love it, love it. And the trainers, of course, are absolutely amazing. Trainers are so, so good. I think they come out today, actually, in Dover Street. Um, so if you've entered the raffle, good luck to you. But yeah, the, the kind of off-white color is definitely the one to get after you kind of beat those in after a while. They'll definitely turn them good. But then that black is just insane, isn't it? It kind of looks like an Anish. You remember that Anish Kapoor ink that he bought? Where it was like the truest black. It kind of reminds me of that a little bit. Just how black it, just how black it looks in this photo. It's insane. It's just literally pitch black. Like they really ramped up the tone on that one, but yeah, the the, the off white cell kind of colorway is the one I'd like. Cause after a while, beating that in a bit it reminds me a little bit of the Tom Sachs colorway, where you wear that in a while and it just it just improve over time, x than tenfold. So yeah, absolutely smashed it. So that was a collaboration I absolutely loved. Um, there again, and um, yeah, man, the whole collections are all awesome. I can't wait to see them come out. There's probably a few more that we're gonna see that we haven't seen so far. We have to kind of wait with bated breath to see those collections um but yeah nike are doing the, are doing a good job man they got the right people um to take part in these collaborations they've given them the room to create they haven't necessarily just given them a shoe to color to just change the colorway of and i just think nowadays this level of this these levels of tastemakers influencers designers culture kids just won't accept having colorway changes anyway they, they won't accept that they want they want to have they'd much rather die on their sword trying to do something and just changing the colorway they're not going to just want to take an air force one and make it black they're going to want to do more than that and even in air force one they're going to try and do some sort of tooling change right where they're going to change the components of the midsole they're going to take off a few um like even your cold will do with their, with their air force one that's due to come out right where you know they're minus some minus some eyelets um they're going to want to change a, a model and just kind of, you know, really make it their own for the most part. And that's something that I'm really, really um, envious of seeing with these kids going, coming up. And I hope in the future I also get opportunity to do the same thing with my own uh, collection. That would be fucking awesome, innit? That would be fucking awesome. Anyway, um, it's been, what you call it? It's been nearly, oh, I'll move the camera there. It's been an hour already, or maybe a bit more. So it might be a good opportunity now to kind of bring this episode to a screeching halt. But that's not the end of it that is not the end of it because after this show i'm gonna add on to the end of this audio version of this podcast if you're watching on video unfortunately this is where it ends but for you guys listening on the podcast via itunes and via google play via spotify and every other platform you use podcast listening to i'm going to attach a mix i recently uh, put together which contains some new house sort of vibes that i've been listening to over the past week so if you're interested to hear what i sound like djing or if you listen to hear the kind of stuff that i'm into when i do go out and dj i implore you to listen to the mix it's about an hour long um, I'll, I'll attach the link to the actual mix below so you can check it out on mixcloud and whatever it may be because that's the best place to host them because on soundcloud there's too many copyright strikes on there i've had like three accounts on mic on soundcloud shut down over the last few years which is annoying because you build up a mass a mass quite a big following on there and then they shut it down and start again it's just 
fucking annoying um so yeah i've uploaded it onto mixcloud so you can check that out I'll, I'll put the link below in the show notes but yeah this has been the action Zing show episode number one two six thanks so much for tuning in it's been an absolute pleasure to have your ears if you're listening via the audio version you'll hear a nice mix coming in right about now and if you're watching this via youtube this is where i sign off sayonara and i'll see you again very very soon peace